So I also realized that I'm the only thing between you and lunch. Stop. I mean, and you have 60 slides. <laughs> <laughs> Not to worry. Okay, I'll try and talk above your growling stomachs and uh, make it make it palatable here, so we can get out of lunch. So I, I'm here to talk to you today about, uh, you know, these tools, these cool tools, are they really cool for us, or are they just going to be more barriers for people with disabilities and activity limitations? I'm June, and as Tom said, my assistant's in the back there, my colleague, um, Frank Primo, I'm waving her hand in the back row. We're right down the street at the Center for Disability Issues and the professions at Western University. And our center basically works to enhance the health of people with disabilities through public policy, consulting, training, research, and dissemination activities. I'd like to talk to you today about who is this population exactly, and what is the meaning of healthcare access for us, and what are our opportunities in terms of what you're talking about today, both on the provider side and the consumer side, in terms of improving the quality of our health and healthcare, and what will make these tools actually usable. So in terms of who is this population, and there are actually many more people than is commonly recognized. And many people don't identify as having a disability and will never ever fit those 67 disability definitions defined in federal law and regulations. However, we, this population, include people with a very broad and, di and diverse kinds of activity and functional limitations. So there are many people who have limitations which are affected by size, by speech, by hearing, by vision, by learning and understanding, by balance and walking, and by strength, coordination, manipulation, and dexterity and my breathing, endurance, bowel and bladder control. Some of these disabilities and activity limitations are really very hidden, and some are actually very visible. So in terms of your purposes here, I'm asking that you look at this in a very broad way in terms of thinking about disability and not thinking about it in compartments we're thinking about it in terms of a broad spectrum of people that um, have these limitations along a continuum of severity and uh, duration, partial to total, temporary and permanent, and mild to catastrophic. And it's a population where one size does not fit all. And because of our diversity, there are no the disabled. So one of the things we've learned the hard way over the years in working with healthcare is that we often weren't talking the same language when it, we talked about access to healthcare. So we've looked at this now in terms of two prongs. One is what most people need, the ability to get the healthcare you need when you need it. Access to screening, specialists, um, getting just help, timely care of colds, viruses, flus. But then, for people with limitations, there's this whole other prong of access that is equally as important, and that level relates to physical communication, equipment, and service and program access. So in terms of the uh, provider side opportunities here, 
uh, as Tom says, welcome to our neighborhood. <laughs> um, our objective is really to increase our hassles by avoiding the magical thinking or the lack of thinking on the provider side in terms of prong to of access. So to give you an example, for example, no matter how often you remind providers of what you need in terms of a <laughs> high-low cable, they always start with this, they always begin with just hop off, and so it looks kind of like this. <laughs> yeah, that's basically the magical thinking here. <laughs> and this story, this, this, this is not atypical. One of our people told us exam chairs are impossible to get in and out of. And I have to have my husband or an office worker help me. I've delayed visits to doctors' offices because it takes a village to get me on and off the exam table, which means I don't get preventative care appointments. I, there's one provider I visit frequently, and it usually starts this way. They take me in the room and I say, uh, I need one of those high-low tables, and they say, we don't have any. And I go, oh, let's try exam room three seven, and fifteen. And they go, oh, okay. So, what's an opportunity here? Well, I've named it QSA, Quality Service and Supported Accommodation Alerts. I'm going to work on that, that's not quite it, but QSA, Quality Service Alerts. So what are they? I think they can significantly help in terms of what you're talking about with that second prong of access and can decrease what this population experiences a lot in terms of frustration, fatigue, and the failure, the hassles involved that drive many people away from getting health care and contribute to health disparities, lack of care, delayed diagnosis, and worsening conditions that lead to downward spirals of deteriorating health and eventually do require more expensive and extensive health care. So why not this QSA when somebody comes in? Pops up an alert, use high love table in 312 and 15. <laughs> or this. Use the accessible scale. This avoids the way too often G-U-W approach. You know what that is? Take a guess. G-U-W. Cute, but no. Cute <laughs> is guess your weight. Guess your weight. Now you know what, to the, what you're going to get as a physician if you ask someone to guess their weight. It won't be accurate, and you know it. And Weight is a major screening issue. And sometimes it looks this way. It takes you to the loading dock. This is the way of healthcare plan, <laughs> shipping and receiving. <laughs> and my colleague said to me, you know, June, you think that's funny. That's not funny. They weigh me in the laundry room where they weigh the sheets. There is equipment out there. It is accessible. There are accessible scales. What about this QSA? Unable to stand. Very helpful when you have a person needing a mammography who cannot stand. Or this one needs two technicians to assist with positioning. QSA alert. Very helpful.